Ready? Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, video game music podcast. This is episode 34-6 and we're your hosts. My name is... My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm in need of some more soup. I almost said that my name is Purnell. Yeah, I was like this close. I understand. You saw me just conclude yeah. the consumption of this soup, and you thought, man, I wish I were eating that soup. You're the soup man. It's an actual transition. I get it. Um, every week, we listen to great video game music from all consoles and all generations. We pick a topic, we pick some tracks, and we listen to the music, and we talk about the music and everything in between. Um, and uh, this week on the show we have a special guest joining us to talk about some very special games um we like to welcome to the show nintendrew hey how's what? it oh hey hey welcome it going? <laughs> it's going great Thanks for having me <laughs> welcome aboard welcome aboard um so for now how did you uh, how did you come across uh, drew here let's let's go around the table and talk about our relationships <laughs> oh well you see i'm swooning over here <laughs> um so i i got offered a review code for a little game called carl um i've been playing on the xbox and it's interesting because i've been hitting this weird window of time where i play a lot of games whether it's reviews or whatever so there's a bit of jadedness that's starting to kind of crust over me, whether I wanted to or not. It just happens when you play a lot of stuff. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I guess I'll review this game, whatever. And I started playing it, and I don't know what it was. I It's hard to encapsulate what triggered this, but I started smiling, and then oh. I kept <laughs> playing, and then I started listening to the music on the internet. <laughs> I continued to listen to the music on the internet, and then when it came time to do the review proper, I was like, I don't know who wrote this music, but I want the water show. I want the water show. And conveniently, we were able to get Drew on the show. So that's yeah. why he's here. I'm thrilled to be here. I, honestly, I it's it's uh, this is a weird kind of uh, coincidence just because I, through the development of Carl, I... <laughs> I had multiple times during the development where I was like, oh man, I really hope I get some opportunities to talk about this music once the game is out. <laughs> because I we've like I feel like we've undersold in the marketing angle like how much that was important to the experience, but like music was always very uh the, the soundtrack was very core to the experience for sure. And yeah. I gotta say Well that makes me happy to hear. Oh and yeah. like I feel like <laughs> even if you guys didn't push the sell of that, I would like to hope that anyone playing Carl picks up on it naturally because um you can give the full sizzle in a sec but the game is a <laughs> is a is a actually it's like a basic a platformer um but the main character carl a robot uh he he it looks like just a normal thing like he just has a head with stuff on it mm -hmm. or whatever but it clicked for me by like the second level that whenever you enter a stage <laughs> the music is kind of like light and like kind of like aural not really heavy but then you notice him animate himself as putting headphones on his head. And then when the headphones come on, the music picks up. Oh, I love that. Which implied to me, I was like, is he listening to the OST while he's running around the levels? <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Like he's, he has to listen to music to work. Yeah. Just like, just like the rest of us. Just like exactly. the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get yeah, things yeah. done. Slap on these headphones and go, <laughs> go to business. But like, yeah, I, I, was, I was enamored with that. I was like, this is amazing. I like that you put that level of emphasis on the music as it's playing in <laughs> yeah. the game. It's great. I, I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, but what we, I mean, what we do is music. I mean, that's all, like, yeah. from half the time, more than half the time, most of the time, music is what sells us on the game in the first place. Like, we listen to the music first, or we hear some, like, some snippets of the soundtrack, and we're like, ooh, that's got me interested more than anything else. Um, so, like, tell us about, like, maybe a little bit about yourself and your experience, like, maybe about the development of Carl, or maybe just give us a kind of a, like a quick overview of Carl, and then we'll kind of get into the topic of the show. Sure, that sounds great, yeah. Cool. So Carl uh, was, honestly, it's, it, I feel like at this point it's a little embarrassing to actually recount the whole story just because <laughs> the first inception of the idea of Carl happened actually over a decade ago. Um, back when I was uh, still studying in college, I was uh, uh, going for my computer science undergrad, and I, uh, I felt imp uh, compelled one evening to, to make a, a sort of um, a mock-up screenshot, I guess, of, of some pixel art. I hadn't really done much pixel art up until that point, but I, I wanted to imagine, like, if I were to, you know, out, out of college, if I were to work in the games industry, which was my, my dream, 
uh, I wanted to have a picture of like, oh, what could be a first cool like debut title, you know? And so I ended up with uh, a little mock-up screenshot of what Carl uh, ultimately became. Uh, and I, I actually, I, I did get a job in the game development industry right out of college. Uh, I started working in mobile games uh, and uh, I produced a few titles uh, from a, a local studio here. Uh, and then a lot of time passed. Uh, Carl was still kind of, you know, in the back of my head for for the better part of this decade, mm -hmm. um, and I you know I played around with some some um, I, I think it actually ended up it was it passed through I, I want to say three different engines I think we started with Game Maker mm -hmm. and then uh, I, I tried it out in uh, which with Box 2D and Java and then ultimately ended up the, the game came out uh, using Unity um, but I uh, I had this this sort of prototype demo for for many years. Uh, and I think the last time I touched it was in 2016. And one of my old co-workers and my best friend, uh, Matt Bittner of Morningstar Game Studio, he reached out to me in 2020, like right as the pandemic was was ramping up. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I finished my last game. I don't really have anything lined up and I'm, I'm looking for a new project to start. And he said, what if that project was Carl? Like, can I help you get this thing finished and Ooh. out the door? And I said, absolutely, let's do it. So we... Uh, we kind of split at that point the the programming work. Um, I've been responsible for the soundtrack and and music music and art and and design and, and things like that. He wow. he took on the bulk of the level design and we kind of split the programming load. So nice. Uh, it's definitely a, a labor of love. It's uh, we would call it a platformer with heart. It's um, if if you don't know anything about it, it's kind of a it's it's a platformer that's inspired by some of my favorite games growing up, like Cave Story and uh, Jazz Jack Rabbit, Super Paper Mario. Um, uh, just a, a lot of a lot of the things that impacted me as a an early gamer it it makes included me, in, in in the title it makes me happy hearing you describe it as a platformer with heart because <laughs> when i talked about it on sml and i was going through the you know the rabble like you know what do you think of this game for now i'm like i don't know how to explain it but <laughs> i can feel a fair bit of heart coming out of this game like i had never heard your tagline but that was my exact description. I was like, I can, I can, it, this game exudes heart. And I can't oh. explain how or why, but it makes me <laughs> like it more. And that's, I feel like but that's what people are looking for too, you know? Like, there's graphics and there's gameplay, but like, people are looking for like the experience of like almost this authenticity, this genuine, um, like positive feeling. Yeah. yeah. And the thing about it is that, so like, the game industry as a whole feels like a freaking mill. It really does half the time yeah. these days. Mm -hmm. So, even back in the day, and also why I was really excited when I was like, wait a minute, he's inspired by Cave Story, I can tell, is the fact that <laughs> back when that game first became rather popular with people and started becoming known, it had a similar impact on me back then. I'm not sure if Rob yeah. remembers, we were friends even back then, but like, I was buying my PS2 games or whatever because I was kind of entrenched in the habit of just getting what comes out. But I wasn't really feeling the vibe so much, just going through the paces. And then someone told me about this downloadable game called Cave Story that I thought wasn't going to amount to much. But I was like, hey, it's free 99. What's to say no to that, right? And I booted it up. And then I became obsessed with it. Like, I played through <laughs> it three times, which for anybody who's listening to the show will tell you, yeah. for now, never replays games. And that's, and that's, <laughs> and that's a one-person development team yeah. right there. And, and when it first launched, it was free also. It was just... Yeah. It was just out there, it was and, just out there. I mean, obviously they've made like new um, versions of it, but I, I as a young, uh, I don't know, student, I I, I played Cave Story uh, early days, and I was just enamored the same way. I, I saw it, and I was like, this is insane that somebody in I think it was 2004, I want to say when it first came out, yeah, and, yeah. and I was just blown away that one person could manage to make an experience that was so impactful, and I I was inspired by that and wanted to to try to make something on my own. I ended up making it as a, a, a duo project instead of a solo project, but I'm still really proud of what, what we managed to put out there. Uh, at the time that Matt approached me, it was just like, you know, I, I've, I've had this in mind as a solo project for the entire time it's been in my head, but it's never going to come out if I don't get some help. So I'm like, I, I was too busy with YouTube, so. Then help I, arrive. Good to have his help. Yeah. <laughs> like on the wings. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let, let's start uh, listening to some music. So the the, top, yeah. the topic for today is um, inspirations and influences. So I think, Drew, you brought um, some tracks and some music from some games that were um, heavy influences for you and maybe influences for the game Carl. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I chose yeah. from some games that were um, heavily influenced from other genres and other games. 
and I chose tracks that would be influential in a game if I were to ever create one. Oh, okay, so things okay, that have influenced cool. you creatively. Yeah, in the event of making a, specifically making a <laughs> game that doesn't exist yet. Okay, I like that. <laughs> all right, um, all right. So then let's get started with some tunes. Um, so Drew, you've got uh, a few tracks, and why don't you uh, pick one, and then let's start uh, start listening. Sure. Uh, well, we were just talking about Cave Story, so why don't we uh, start off with Onto Grass Town? All right. So this is uh, we're gonna listen to the track Onto Grass Town from the game Cave Story. This is composed by Daisuke Imaya. We're back. We're listening to Onto Grass Town from Cave Story, composed by Daisuke Imaya. And um, this little this little number <laughs> was brought to us by Drew. And yeah. oh man, God, once once that second part kicks in, me and Pernell <laughs> were just like bobbing our heads. Like we were like <laughs> like halfway to headbanging here in the studio. It's, yeah, it goes hard. It goes hard. <laughs> so think of, again, like this so I gotta say, like, so first and foremost, this is the track. That was the point in the game where I was like, I'm in. I'm all in for, <laughs> for this game. And yeah. I actually did. I didn't pick on the grass town, but way back in 2016, like one of our very first episodes on the show, I picked a track from, I picked a cover of this track called Grass Stains. Yes. Which oh, if nice. you've never heard it, look it up. You will love it. But Yeah, I'll have to for sure. But tell it. But enough about me. This was your trick. So yeah, so yeah. Tell us. So tell us. Tell us about 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 your love of Cave Story and, um, and oh, this music. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I touched on that a bit, but I, I just the music is such a huge part of what really stuck up stuck out to me in Cave Story. It it every track feels important in some way. Mm. It's 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 all it it feels authentic to the era that it's trying to encapsulate but it's it's also just driving and really complex in some ways it it feels to me almost like the the stuff that Tim Fallon put out on the NES like with Pictionary and uh, Solstice where it like starts out where it's kind of simple just like you know a little boppy chiptune track and then suddenly the percussion of the synths <laughs> and the, the bass comes in and it's just like in your face like yeah. you are on an adventure this is this is really happening. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, like, like the, the just... opening to Solstice, right? You're listening to like the opening <laughs> yeah. to the game Solstice. And you're like, oh, this is cute, and then like four minutes later, you're like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> this is like so... Tim, you calm down. You didn't have to do that much. <laughs> I have to do this very... much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone has to know I was on this cart. I gotta say, like this, the way this track starts, um, it's got like that little oompa oompa bass, but like, uh -huh. very, but it's so stripped down, it's almost silly. But then once all <laughs> once all the other instruments come in, it's. You, it's like, oh, I get it now. It's such a I fun area, yeah. too, because, I mean, that's the level where, like, the, the, you get swarmed by those bees. Uh, the jellyfish monsters start popping up on that mm -hmm. level. It's, it, for that area in the game, that point in the game, it feels more frantic than the other areas that came before, which was, I think, was, like, the egg chamber, yeah. um, the first trip mm -hmm. to the egg chamber. But, like, this place was like, yes, this is frantic. And I feel like there was at least one or two times, like, <laughs> I got to go back. Just, I'm getting overwhelmed here. Go back to the door and heal up and be my good village. Um, <laughs> oh, that's a good opportunity for me to ask. I gotta confirm this now. So, 
when I played Carl, when I entered the dump, I was uh -huh. like, something about this reminds me of K-Story. <laughs> the audio, there was like light audio keys. I was like, this is K-Story. I just know it, but I can't prove it. And then you go into the bar that's in the dump, <laughs> which I'll tell you about why I keep saying that way in a second. But uh, there was a picture of, quote, on the bar wall. And I was like, yep, uh -huh. there it is. This, so you got to <laughs> tell me, though. Did you have any inspiration from the track for Mimiga Village when you crafted the track for the dump area? Oh, no, not at all. Nuts! <laughs> I was so... No, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I always envisioned Woo! the dump as kind of like... Uh, I, 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 I started Carl with this idea of a story told around a village of robots that were thrown away by their creator or decided to defect voluntarily because they weren't in line with his vision, you know? Mm -hmm. And... In, in creating that world, the Mimiga Village was definitely just the, the first biggest inspiration that stood out to me as far as this this group of, of robot alien, or not uh, uh, rabbit, <laughs> not robot, of rabbit, uh, weird alien, uh, what's the word, uh, like bipedal. Ba family uh, furball <laughs> like, friends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, like, there's, there's like, these cool little cute robot, or uh, rabbit, I keep saying robot. Like anthrop <laughs> these, anthropomorphic? These creatures, anthropomorphic? You know? Yeah, anthropomorphic, oh, that's yeah. the word I was looking for, uh, thank you. Uh, they're, they're these creatures that are living the only way they know how, in this limited space where they've been, you know, tossed away from from the, the life that they were used to, and I felt like that really encapsulated the, the vibe that I was going for, so I definitely took a lot of inspiration from, from that area in, in Cave Story. And I also like that as you're playing the game, every once in a while, you'll come across the ability to rescue a robot that's being overworked and oh, living the that. life it doesn't <laughs> want to live. That's a yeah. That's a very odd world thing. Have you played the odd world game at all? Very odd little. I'll, 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 I need to, to to delve more into it's, that series for sure. You know, I have like this crazy nostalgia for it because I spent a lot of time on it um, when I was younger. Because it just like kind of kind of captured my imagination in a way that was like I'm just gonna put up with the absolute worst controls known to man. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm afraid to go back to that game <laughs> to see what it's really like. Um, but yeah, yeah. There's throughout the game there's there's little other workers and other slaves that you're trying to uh, emancipate. And half the fun of the game is you're solving puzzles that you don't know are gonna kill them half the time. So like they're just kind of like you're you're getting you're, you're kind of getting scored on freeing as many people as possible, but you want to free them. Like they're, they're it's so sad, but like you know they're gonna get smushed along the way. Every once in a while, you gotta break a few omelets to make an yeah. egg. Or I yeah. love how I just got that completely backwards. And I'm sticking break with it. Gotta <laughs> break an egg. Yeah. <laughs> Tip yep. world time chambers. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> but we but you did out something for yourself earlier in this chat, which. Makes both of us very sad, Rob. Oh yes, I know. Before before we came back on the microphone, I did say I have not finished Cave Story. You came over to the house and you saw the giant tank thing that I got stuck on. Mm -hmm. You couldn't beat it. No, I beat that tank. I'm oh, are you talking about the X thing? The, yes, the, yeah. the, the X tank right in the, the that was in the lab. When I was a kid, that that is the place I was stuck for months. Uh, <laughs> you were and, not alone. <laughs> and by and by a kid, I think I was. With, was it 30? 36, 37. <laughs> you were definitely in your 30s. Who's counting, right? But, you know? we, we just moved into this house. I was at least five years ago. So. But, like, I don't remember why, but, like, I actually went, I mean, again, you have to go back to this game. Like, I just went back and refinished the game oh. within the last, like, oh, just, earlier this year for oh, four in February. rubbing it in. I'm Look, rubbing it in for a, a purpose. What a brag for it, now. It's <laughs> for a reason, because I want you to play, like, I'm telling you, like, oh, no, no. that the running hell segment at the very end, if you unlock it, is like the epitome of like this is fantastic. Okay, okay. I I, I can't. <laughs> I, get it. I get it. But I'm I'm trying to be a true gamer now because I I don't play a lot of games. So I'm at the point now where I'm playing a little bit of a game and getting a little bit far and enjoying it, and then playing something else. And so I feel like I'm I'm living the life. Well, here's a trick for living you: the true life. Acknowledging that K3 also is not the longest of games. I know. You get it. Yeah. The only thing I would say might give you the most grief if you get past Weapon X, which you will, because if I have to sit on the damn couch and help you beat him, that's going to happen. But <laughs> it's, uh, for my replay, the things that gave me trouble in the current stage was like the, well, not even the final boss pre running hell, but the boss before that boss. The basically, Rob won't get the context for this, but the doctor fight before you deal with misery right. and all that. Um, the doctor fight gave me the most trouble. And then just getting the jumps right and running hell. <laughs> but after that, it was like, yes, I'm on the run again. This is amazing. Uh, 
But yeah, I'm telling you, I'll I just get, want you to there. play this because I want to hear <laughs> your take because I swear, I again, I replayed I it and the feeling came back. It wasn't like a one-time <laughs> fluke. I'll get back there. I got to start from the beginning again to get my uh, to get my legs back, you know? Like, you stop playing a game for a while and you forget, like, how to play it. Don't take the I'm machine terrified. gun. I'm <laughs> terrified. I am terrified to go back to Super Metroid at this point. You can do it. I can. I know I can do it. It's you there. can do it. Get my little save file. All right. Anyway, enough about... No, stop. Stop piling on. I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to start... Okay, my, my, my first track for this episode is going to be from the game 30XX, which is heavily inspired by um, uh, Mega Man X, or the X series. Yeah. I was just talking about that game. Well, this is the sequel to 20X. I haven't played 30XX yet, but I've played the heck out of 20XX, which is essentially a roguelike of um, Mega Man X. And it's fantastic. And the music is by the um, artist City Fires, Brandon Ellis, and it is incredible. So we're going to listen to the main theme to 30XX. God, that was the main theme from 30XX wow. <laughs> from, from uh, City Fires, Brandon Ellis. Tracks you don't want to press the start button to. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you can stay on that main screen all day long. I almost bought that game last night, but I talked myself <laughs> out of it because I was like, you haven't played enough 20XX and there's still an early access. <laughs> Hold on. Don't jump in the ship yet. Uh, it, it's great. It's uh, the idea of a roguelike uh, Mega Man X is is really a fascin. It's a fascinating way they went about it. Where um, you imagine an Enter the Gungeon, you know, it's always the same rooms, but they're kind of randomized in different ways. And you might see some rooms more than others, but it's always randomized. And they do the same thing with twenty with uh, with the Mega Man X idea, where it's like, I guess they took maybe sections of a of a horizontal platformer and they would just sort of put them into different configurations every time you play. And it messes with me oh, a little bit. So interesting. The fact that it works messes with me too by just because I always felt what part of what makes Mega Man X so great is the tight frenetic platforming, but in order for that to really mm -hmm. shine, you have to have the set pieces that actually bring it yeah. out. So I feel like what they did and yeah. this and this is my my take on this game is what they did was they took that really fun feeling control of Mega Man X and just it made it so so, um, like e not just easy to control, but they made it very very um, like soft, so that so that you can have these impossible chasms to jump, into uh, these hugely tall walls to climb because the controls are like, hey, you can do anything you want; it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so they they, they just they kind of give you they kind of give it to you in that way. They say you can just pretty much do anything Mega Man X could do, just a lot easier. So yeah. that you can traverse these like impossibly like randomized levels, um, but then of course the, the the bosses themselves are always like you know 
in their own place. Oh, yeah. But yeah, very, very good. So I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this one. You mentioned uh, Anamana Gucci on this track. Yes. And not just the guitar, but I feel like like early-ish Anamana Gucci. Um, um, what's that? What's that track? Oh, like uh, Fast, like, what, the fast Turtle. Uh, Airbrushed. Yes. Air, Airbrush is like one of my favorite songs from them. And I feel like it's because they use the the NES to be almost like a like a vocalist. It's like lyrical. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's like like with like with this song, I feel like there's lyrics to this song that we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, a whole lot of pitch bending. A whole lot of pitch bending. Which is yeah. which always the, like my first thought was um yeah. the Mutant Mud soundtrack. I feel like it, it Oh a lot of- I see we're going to get along great. <laughs> no one ever talks about Mutant Muds, and that game is oh, man, it's stupendous. Great. It's yeah. so good. And then they had, they had the freaking, like, the the ultra-challenging levels they added later, and people were like, this is dumb. I was like, no, this is what I wanted. <laughs> this is for me. But, like, yeah, Mutant Muds. Got to bring it by yeah. some time, Rob. I don't know this one. Yeah. You would love it. Yeah. It's, it's another case of a platformer that they don't make it too complicated. You have very few actual functions but the exploration and the music, it's in the color. It just, it's a great play. And by the next thing you know, the game is over. And you don't even know how you got there. Huh. Like, <laughs> I played that game to death on two consoles. <laughs> so, like, it's a good game. I'll have to check that one. Mutant Mud. Mutant Mud? Muds with 2D. Oh, like, um. You can unlock your grandma. M- multiple user, <laughs> uh, multiple user dungeon. Well, well, yes. I, um, I, well, mud. Think about mud. Yeah, like okay. back back in like the '80s or whatever. There were there were text adventures. Now this game is literal mud. Oh, it's actually mud. Okay, literal angry mud. <laughs> 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 all right, so not as nerdy as I was I was thinking originally. <laughs> all right, um, all right. So that's 30XX. I think everyone should give it a try. Pernell, what's your first track? All right, so I guess I'm gonna go with. If, if I'm talking about a game, um, games that would inspire an RPG or a game of mine, spoiler, it's going to be an RPG. It's me you're talking about. Of course, um, of course. I'm going to pick a track from this game, which is Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. Uh, of course, Ooh. it's Persona 2. Unfortunately, we just had two very light and breezy tracks. <laughs> mine is not that. Um, the track title is Kasugayama High School from Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, composed by the Atlas Sound Team, composed of Toshiko Tasaki, Kenichi Tsuchiya, and Masaki Kurokawa. back you're listening to kasugayama high school from the game persona 2 eternal punishment good luck spelling that track title by and the it was uh, composed <laughs> by this was a human league or a new order yes <laughs> all of those things those. No, actually it's from the atlas sound team composed by of toshiko tasaki kenichi Tsuchiya, and masaki kurokawa mm. so it makes me almost sad that this track pretty much plays in like a dungeon that you don't even have to go to in the game it plays and like what's considered the grind dungeon of the game. You go back there in between levels 
to fight monsters you've already fought to get like the like summon cards and to get experience points to get new personas. Um, but this track, while you are there, it is a great track to run around in circles to. I can tell you that much. Um, I'm a huge fan of this tune. I've been listening to it off and on since 2001. Mm. It's stuck with me. And I thought it'd be a good track to pick one because I just wanted to play it on an episode of the show and I'm shocked I never brought <laughs> it on here. Um, but the other reason is because I feel like if I were going to make a game, everyone that knows me knows I likely want an RPG. <laughs> but I like, even though a lot of people talk about, you know, power fantasy, people want power fantasies in their games. I feel like for my game to be a legitimate power fantasy, it has to have some semblance of reality involved in it because you want it to feel like it's something that only with a few slight tweaks and twerks, you can experience this. <laughs> it happened, uh, uh, you know. Uh, what, what kind of twerks, Pernell? You know, quick, quick, quick. <laughs> um, shake the thing. No, nah, yeah. but like the yeah. basically like a modern. I want it to be a modern setting. I want it to be yes. a game that takes place in an environment that technically, again, aside from a few fantasy tweaks. You could live there. You could be there. You could experience that the very next day. Well, I think that's why, like the Mega Ten and, and, the, and the early Persona series, like worked so well and like capturing that idea, like that imagination, and really kind of pulling you in, is because, like, it's that real world with all those fantasy elements like thrown into it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it's like Drew. Have you had any experience playing like any of the Mega Ten type titles or anything? No, I've I've been I've been told that uh, that I'm missing out. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I can say I'm sure it would be right up my alley for sure. Well, I can say I've, I saw your setup. I watched one of your episodes where you gave everybody a tour of like your game setup. You yeah. have a lot of very fantastic Nintendo consoles there, of which <laughs> one was at least a 3DS, which has Soul Hackers yeah. on it, and Shin Megami okay. Tensei Four. So just say it. You can, you can do it. I believe there's, there's it. Good, yeah. ent good entries into the series. Hey, I got homework, so. right? <laughs> can't come, can't bring you here out an assignment to take home with you. Or enjoy the soundtracks on a rainy day because I, <laughs> I feel like the, yeah. the early Mega Ten games, the early Persona games, it's just it's dark and funky at the same time. And admittedly, the games are extremely long, so I wouldn't hold it against anybody. Yeah. Like I got <laughs> God, even the new Persona games are super long. They're longer. They're like you're like, Rob, you gotta play Persona Five. It's the greatest game. I'm, I'm like, all right. Four years later, <laughs> I finally finished it. I'm like, that was good. I loved it. I'll never do it again. That was a long game. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the thing that's amazing to me, I'm curious about your take on this too, Drew, is that uh, so like I played through Persona Five, the base game, took me 145 hours or so, an absurd amount of time. And when Royal got announced, which was like Persona 5, but with more content story-wise and otherwise, people were like, I can't wait to play this again. Pernod, are you going to play it again? I was like, I'll likely buy it again. I'm going <laughs> to tell you I'm going to play it again. But we all know I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I just can't. Okay, but... Oh, I'm sorry, you were going to ask him something. No, you go ahead. Say what you all right, all right. So there's, but there's games that you are going to replay. Yeah, but they're usually shorter ones. Yeah, but they're all but they're with maybe Persona's that game that someone else wants to replay. Is there a game like you like to replay or revisit all the time, Drew? Oh man, I, I feel like my my gaming habits do come in cycles. I feel like I always end up coming back to a few. Um, mm. I mean, obviously, there's like some standbys that were just pillars in the, the times that they were released. Like Super Mario sixty four is, yes. is an obvious one. Like that's that's easy to go back into and have a good time. But practically, I feel like most often it ends up being. Uh, just kind of, I, I tend to go back to sandbox games, I think. Like, games that, that you can really just kind of do whatever you want and, and blow off some steam if you need to, you know, just have a good time in the environment. So, you mentioned, like, having a, a real-world environment that you can go experience and, and feel like it's connected somehow to a real-world experience. I, I, I have a lot of fun with stuff like GTA 4. Yeah. Set yeah. In, uh, a copy of New York City. Um, <laughs> I in that same vein, I have a lot of fun with the Saints Row series. Uh, Saints Row 3 and 4 are both really fun to, to revisit for me. I feel like more often than not, though, it's got to be either Minecraft, <laughs> which is maybe a milk toast kind of pick, but uh, I like to go back to Minecraft every once in a while, get, get lost in that. Uh, and then Team Fortress 2, maybe oh. an odd pick, but that's one that I, I really uh, I sunk way too much time into <laughs> as a as a teen, and uh, I've, I've revisited it hey. ever since. Hey, we sunk too much time into it as adults. Yeah, so we it's did. <laughs> I think we were actually talking about it just last week. <laughs> yeah, we were. Yeah, we were, nice. It, it came out. How did it come up again? It was, it was probably in relation to like the ability to have a game where you had characters that had very specific roles that you could play. Yes. So it allowed for yeah. the freedom of uh -huh. ability to play, even if you weren't particularly skilled at this aspect yeah, of gaming. I, I think I was. Yeah. I wasn't like railing against like Overwatch or anything like that. But I feel like Team Fortress Two. 
um, really distilled it down into a really fun way where like, you know, if you weren't a great, if you weren't great at like aiming and fighting like that, like you could be a support character and it would still be a ton of fun. And also I just realized the other reason why we brought it up last oh, week, because the topic game. was working games. It was working games. So we were talking about games that <laughs> don't necessarily feel like work as in like the negative S, but we just generally like, you're on the job. You're getting stuff yeah, done. Yeah. And I used to play the engineer, and so you would build those turrets, and they would break down, and it felt like I just felt like I was on the job, constantly trying to fix these things, <laughs> and like stay alive and try to fix these these stupid things. The doctor's like, "I'm not getting paid enough for this mess. You people keep getting shot." Because then people on the voice chat are like, "Man, the turret's down again." I'm like, "I'm on it." <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> and like, and, and now I work in like IT, and then I do like all sorts of support and stuff. And they're like, "Rob, the computer's broken." I'm like, "I'm gonna get the turret." <laughs> Don't you wish you could just take a giant wrench and just start smacking the computer yeah. like, working, working, <laughs> done. That would make my life a lot more fun. <laughs> just bang, 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 why, bang. Why is Rob in the server room? He's like, clack, 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 clack. <laughs> All right, so um, we're back around to you, Drew, to your uh, your next pick of uh, inspirational games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, the second one I picked out was uh, from another series that definitely inspired me a lot for for Carl's gameplay and story and everything. Uh, my second track is the Professor Frankly theme from Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Let's have a listen. <laughs> We're back. You're listening to Professor Frankly from Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door for the Nintendo GameCube. This one's composed by Yoshito Hirano and Yuka... Okay, I wrote that. Wow. I... Yuka something, because I did not type that. <laughs> you can I... come back later and be like, yeah, written by Yuka Blaze. You know what? <laughs> Hirano is going to get all the credit on this one. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come up on the notes later. Uh, I, I, I'm loving all, all of the weird percussion in this song. I swear, there's a vibra slap somewhere in the background. There, go there. <laughs> like that's you don't you don't get a vibra slap in many uh many soundtracks. That's it's very 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 cute. It makes me hearing that he chose this and just the dialogue that comes up around Paper Mario games. To this day, it really makes me wonder what's going on over at Nintendo in regards to Paper Mario because. Wait. Just the oh. other day, there was a game <laughs> called The Outbound Ghost I was looking up as a, yet another spiritual successor to Paper Mario that I actually am considering buying. But it makes me sit there and wonder, like, why did they leave this play style at Thousand Year Door? They've made multiple Paper Mario games since then, and none of them play like this anymore. It's just like these odd experiments. They're trying to strike gold when they've already got a pot in their basement. I don't understand <laughs> what they're doing. I don't get it. But I do know that I'll stop rambling after this statement, but <laughs> Paper Mario <laughs> Thousand Year Door was a legit gem. This is one of the games I had bought, sat on the shelf of shame for a while, mm -hmm. and enough people kept poking and prodding me. Like, just stop, just stop kicking the camera oh, and play the game. This is, your, this is your Persona 5. Well, yeah, it was, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but I eventually got back on it, and yeah. I was like, yeah, this is legit. This is legit. Oh, well, but, let me ask you, I gotta ask you in that, in that context, have you played the sequel or the the, the next in entry in the series super paper mario for the I, I did and i gotta tell you you might not like what i say here which is that <laughs> so i bought super paper mario on launch because i was like wow this is like it's like a classic pa mario platform but it's got like freaking rpg stats attached to it and i like the switching from 2 to 3d i even like the art style i like the count i like i like a lot of the game but there was something about the general experience from the game where i was like I'm not really digging the platforming here compared to, like, say, a normal Mario platformer. 
Sure. So yeah. it's like I'm not getting the Mario platform that I want, and I'm not getting the Mario RPG that I want. So I did everything the game had to offer. So it's not like I didn't dislike the, I didn't dislike the game. Like I did everything. I did the bonus dungeon and everything. But when I was done, I was just kind of like, all right, I'm done. But I like <laughs> so I was like, it made me feel bad. I'm like, okay, this was a nice experiment, Nintendo. Let's go back to you know Paper Mario RPG now. <laughs> but of course, as you know, they did not do that. They did not do this thing. I, I I would definitely categorize personally. I you know what different strokes. I've got uh, if if people ask me what my favorite games of all time are, I I, I know this is probably uh, subversive given that I've suggested a thousand year door song, <laughs> but <laughs> Super Paper Mario is definitely the number one on my list of favorite games of all time. So so I, help me out. Give me give me some give me the, the, <laughs> the skinny as it were because I gotta say like. There's, there's you know, like, I think it makes sense to me that it might not have struck you the same way because we we you, you've covered you're an RPG fan, you mm -hmm. know, and I I love a good RPG, but platformers have always been at the core of my uh, I don't know my gaming experience. That's what I started out with. That's what I I've always kind of come back to. If I, you, you look down my list of favorite titles, next up Super Mario Galaxy, Super Mario sixty four. You know, I've got a lot of the yes. the classic uh, Nintendo platformers uh, in 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 that that selection uh and with super paper mario i felt like uh well i should say it super paper mario in particular was definitely another big inspiration for carl and so was paper mario the thousand year door then mm. there's the that that feeling of just you mentioned the, the the idea of a platformer with heart is 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 hard to nail down it's kind of nebulous mm -hmm. and i feel like what it comes down to ultimately is the idea of uh, a, a sort of harmony of of quirky elements in combination with a lot of polish, a lot of, of, of care and attention given to the little details mm. that surprise you in ways that aren't uh, necessarily like, you know, the, you, the game might make you laugh, but not in a way that's necessarily funny, but in a way that surprises you and, and subverts your expectations. And that was really important to me with Carl. And I feel like this theme in particular from The Thousand Year Door really conveys a sense of a, a character that is you know, uh, important and powerful, but also off kilter and like not, you know, maybe not all there. You've got like a, a just an interesting kind of, uh, it, it conveys a sense of, you know, familiarity and, and uh, comfort, but while also being a little weird. <laughs> Would you say it's a little uh, bit of this in Herman? And uh, Herman yes, the scientist Yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So, so Herman was a very early addition to the the story of Carl, and and he is meant to be kind of your your contact on the outside, and he's uh, an, an intrepid engineer, and also uh, you know a little off kilter, just like this song. So <laughs> well, this, yeah. this song yeah, in yeah. particular, uh, along so with uh, some of the songs from the Zelda series, especially the Pirates theme from Wind Waker, which then the, that basic melody was reused for Bruce's theme from The Legend of Zelda: Skyward Sword. Uh, it, it conveys this feeling of just, you know, it's it, it's it's endearing, but it's not quite right. If that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> well, I feel like it to to be kind of goofy and off kilter, and, and to be like open about that. You have to, it, it takes some vulnerability as a person mm -hmm. uh, to be yourself in front of other people. And I feel like you're right. This music kind of conveys that feeling. It's kind of oddball, but also confidently an oddball. Hey, I'm Pernod. Yeah. Want to check out my rock way. collection? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm really, really enjoying that. It, it, it's coming through with that weird <laughs> that weird synthesizer that's a, just a little bit off key, like in that mm -hmm. fun Super Nintendo kind of way. But yeah. um, it's just, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really, really enjoying that. But anyway, while I have you here in the hot seat, and I have... Purnell here in the hot seat. I got some questions for you. Dun, dun, dun. There's a hot seat. There's a hot seat right here. There's, I hope it comes with a hot plate. So we're gonna we're gonna play a game. Uh oh. Um, for for both of you. For the Let's record, go. I was. Who not wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> well, don't we all? <laughs> anyway, that was my only joke. Okay. <laughs> the track sale. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. I was like, I wasn't primed for this this quiz. <laughs> nope, of course not. Um, and you never are. You never <laughs> that is true. Actually. All right, so we are going to listen to next. Um, so this game was uh, um, heavily inspired by Metroid, Super Metroid okay. specifically. This is Axiom Verge. Oh, okay. Um, and going with my theme of sequels that I haven't played yet, Axiom Verge Two. <laughs> um, uh, again, is composed by Thomas Happ. This is called I.O. Echo. 
from the game Axiom Verge 2. Also, I want to, I want to be recorded when I say this. I feel like I am slightly sad now, because I'm like, I was all, once you hit me with the, who wants to be ready? I was like, okay, I'm ready. Where are the questions? Oh, Where yeah. Are the questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now that You were getting really serious, and I'm like, this is not serious for now. <laughs> I got ready this for is, a quiz. This is going to be less than serious. <laughs> this is going to make one person, one of our listeners happy. did buy Axiom Verse 2. I guess uh-huh. I wanted to support him. All right, we're back. You're listening to I.O. Echo from the game Axiom Verge 2. This one's composed by Thomas Happ. Sounds more like Thomas Dolby. It's right. very, very uh, synth-wavy in the best way, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, and it's just that, that driving um, beat. It's got that, that, that kind of gated uh, snare and um, just that, that straight up, that arpeggiated, like, synthesizer that's straight out of like a Yamaha like old school FM synth it sounds really great I, I'm really in, the, the soundtrack of the first one was much more like atmospheric and industrial sounding there wasn't a whole lot of a, of a, of a, of a melody or a tune that you can kind of hang your hat on um, this one it's kind of in between it's like okay we'll give you a little bit more <laughs> of a melody but we're not going to make it a, a melody that's going to get quite stuck in your head it's going to be just a little bit off I gotta say though, I'm actually surprised that you didn't like jump on this unless it wasn't available for a console. You have. Because... I gotta be perfectly honest. When this game was released, I had no idea. Like, I, I, like, <laughs> I think it was like uh, almost a year later. You're like, "Hey, Axiom, Axiom Verge Two. Have you played that one yet, Rob?" And I was like, "What? <laughs> this is a game? <laughs> Dude, that one was that one came out. I mean, I just I had no idea. Um, which I mean, you know, yeah, because Rob me, played but... the first one to death. Yeah, that was fun. Like something about a. Uh, 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 a, a, a explore, a, explorative platformer, Metroidvania style. I just, I get addicted to. If the right one comes around, I'll just play it start to finish. If, and it's just, it's a, it's a compulsion. I have to. <laughs> um, I just, I get, I get like the ex, something about the exploration. I just want to go back, which is funny that I haven't gone back to Super Metroid yet. The, uh, the proto metroidvania literally it is literally the metroid in, yeah in metroidvania <laughs> it is the metro well, hey, it is i'm the gonna metroid. have to if you've uh, i feel like we've already covered uh met or we've covered axiom verge and we covered uh well i guess 30 xx but uh, and, and th- these are reminding me uh, i should uh, drop a plug here for my, my development partner matt bittner of morningstar game studio he made uh, a robot named fight which is oh i played that like, uh, yeah hey yeah. <laughs> that's awesome Hey. Yeah, that, that that was his uh, his solo death project. Wow. So that that's basically just like a you can imagine like the love child of uh, the Binding of Isaac with Super Metroid. A roguelike kind of, uh, Metroid. Really oh, cool nice. Roguelike Metroidvania with compounding items and effects. And yeah, definitely check that out. If you, if that's your your game, you know. And it's funny the timing is perfect. Cause I'm almost positive either Limited Run or Strictly Limited is doing a physical yeah, yeah. of that game like right now. Yep. Yeah, it was uh, just recently dropped. So yeah, check that out. Oh wow. 
That, that's something I want to get on now. <laughs> that sounds yeah. awesome. It's a legit. Yeah. I can yeah. always let you try it at some point. It's all my switch. If you ever, if you ever want to leave it here sometime, at AM. Well, that might <laughs> <fun. laughs> I'll drink a soda while you play. <laughs> but I'm curious, guys. Like, quick random question for you, Drew. So, yeah. if you could think of another type of game, as in not a platformer, that you could mm. have Carl featured in as a character, what would it be? That's interesting. Uh, the, the, the fifth Ninja Turtle. Don't give him my ideas! <laughs> <laughs> but that is true. He could be the fifth Ninja Turtle. You know, I, I feel like another major inspiration. I, I, I really struggled to not <laughs> include this this title in, in, in the, the, the representation here for these tracks. But I, I almost considered I actually almost brought it up when you were playing that Persona 2 track. Because it kind of reminded me of the Undertale ghost fight. Okay. Uh, Undertale is... Uh, definitely another big inspiration for me and is a game that I feel like that sort of RPG I could imagine Carl uh, making a, an appearance in just a, a, a sort of, you know, just that I love the quirky, subversive feel of some of these indie games that just it's clear when, it's clear to me I don't know, when, when the developers have a vision and, and really stick to it and try to, to make an experience that's not just fun but just surprising in a way that sticks with you. Yeah. And I could definitely say, like, sadly, Undertale may will be my true Persona 5 because that's a game. It's gotten to the point where maybe I'll play that before the year's out because, kid you not, one of our listeners actually bought me Undertale for Christmas like, <laughs> a year or two ago. <laughs> and I was like, I got to get on this game, but then I got swamped in reviews, so I never got around uh -huh. to it. But, like, Undertale is like that game that I want to experience. I want to know why everyone has the love that you're describing for it right now. <laughs> like, I want to understand it for It myself. is popular for a reason, for sure. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> we should play it together, because my, my niece really wants me to play it. Well, there you go. Yeah. Oh, man, have you have you both not tried it? No, Neither of us. No, I love the soundtrack. Okay, that, that's your homework, then. you got to try out Undertale. <laughs> <laughs> we're trading assignments. Thankfully, ours yeah. is shorter. <laughs> oh, okay, Pranel, we're on to your, uh, your second track. Okay, this is from a game, speaking of reviews, this is from a game that I reviewed some time ago, but the music for it and the premise stuck with me enough that it would be a good inspiration for my game. Um, this comes from the game Battle Bands, and the track title is called Scrapyard Battle, and it's composed by Fat Bard. <laughs> Welcome back. You're listening to the Scrapyard Battle theme from the game Battle Bands on PC, composed by Fat Bard. Uh, I'm actually wondering if they actually managed to really get this game finished, if they're still in like development and stuff. But when I played it, I knew they were still in the process of building it up, but I liked what I had already seen. And one, the thing about this game is it's pretty much a Battle of the Bands sort of style game, where your band, which you kind of customize, is traveling around the city, Engaging in like narrative events, kind of like a typical roguelike. And every once in a while, you'll come across a band battle. 
where you will be in a location battling against a rival band. And the battles are done through the typical, like, well, I don't want to say typical, but it's become a staple in the genre now, like card battling. But every mm. member of the band plays a different instrument, and then the cards are associated with those instruments. Mm. So it's essentially four character party members that have their own cards that together work as a unit to do, quote-unquote, damage to the other band. So there's like a synergy involved. One player in the band can't carry the battle forward. It has to be a unified front. And if you try to rely on one instrument, you're going to lose. And I chose that for my game because I feel like something that doesn't get explored enough in like RPGs is teamwork and camaraderie. Like, yeah, there's things like uh, Chrono Trigger where there's like te double text and triple text um, and the occasional synergy thing that shows up once in the blue moon in games. But I think it would be interesting to try to craft the RPG where you literally have to work as a team and that all of your attacks, with very few exceptions, are meant to build off of someone else's or to be or bounce off of someone else's. So the general equivalent, like, okay, I have this attack that is like a needle that will do X amount of damage, but I need the alchemist ca character to actually provide me with the chemical that I can load the needle with mm -hmm. to do that damage. Or okay. like elemental synergy is like, okay, well, if we combine fire and ice at the same time, it creates a reaction that creates like a freaking like snowstorm, huh. which hits the guy, which would be pretty nice. Um, it's a lot to think about, and it'd be, it would take an interesting, a good studio to craft it, because what it would intentionally mean is that if one party member was left alive on the field, their only moves would be like desperation attacks mm. or like low level skills with intent to hold down the fort until someone else can get brought back to life so and you, then they can synergize again. So you need you need the full band. You need the full band. You need at least two people. Yeah. Like the full band for the most potential, but you can't, can't do it can't alone. Can't be the one man band. Can't be the one man band. You will <laughs> fail. I should say uh, Fat Bard is a, is a band out of Missouri. Um, it is Patrick Criselius and Zach Fendelman. Well, you uh, guys, I want more of your jams. Well, they've worked on a ton of <laughs> games. Uh, Battle Chef Brigade they've worked on. Um, Demon Turf, Jet Lancer. I don't know. I'm, I'm, Sounds like i got to buy and battle. I'm freaking that guy. I see, I don't know, I see seen that game for uh, Demon Turf. One looks awesome called Mage Quit. <laughs> it's not Mage awesome. Quit. Yeah, Mage Quit. But yeah, yeah, a huge, huge thing. It's so a fatbar.bandcamp.com. We'll have the, we'll have their links on our website for for their music because I am intrigued. I'm just I'm just sad yeah. for my walks. I'm going to buy Demon Turf when I get home. We actually reviewed that on SML, but I wasn't the person that reviewed that game, and it was liked. So we'll see. But this is dope. I gotta ask. Dope I'm, track. Thank you. I try. It's <laughs> true. Giving you the credit for yeah. <laughs> I do my best. I do my best. Uh, so like. Can you think of any, like, you already mentioned Tim Fallon earlier in the episode, but can you think of any, like, favorite composers for VGM that you've come across oh, over the years man. that stuck with you? You know, actually, one of my biggest um, inspirations for, for Carl's soundtrack, again, was um, there's a, a composer, his name is George Shaw, he goes by Adhesive Wombat on, uh, on SoundCloud and Spotify. And, and he contributed to the uh, Slime Son soundtrack, which... Uh, okay. Uh, that soundtrack was probably the single biggest inspiration for the overall vibe, I would say, really? of Carl's soundtrack, where it it kind of, you know, we talked about earlier when I when, when we were looking at the, um, uh, the, the Grasstown theme from mm -hmm. Cave Story, where it kind of starts out as a very simple melody that feels like authentic and, you know, retro. But then as you get into it, it starts to get more driving. It fills out with the percussion and the bass and the synths and everything. And I definitely had this picture early on in Carl where I wanted to have kind of um, I actually I, I don't I don't know how much this will uh, matter to the, to the audience or if this is interesting. Or, or, but basically, a lot of the the hub area and some of the the more repetitive songs that you you, you end up or the, the songs that you end up experiencing multiple times mm -hmm. in a row that are short little loops. I, I composed those mostly in Musagi, which was like a free sort of fake fama tracker oh. kind of um, <laughs> Uh, DAW in, in, in environment, and uh, so it, it sounds very authentic. It sounds very like lo-fi chip tune, um, you know, like uh, just classic, you know. And then I wanted to make it so that there is a distinct difference between the tracks that you hear in the hub mm -hmm. and in the the areas that you revisit frequently to the levels themselves, because there's definitely a big distinction between the areas in the game. Glad you and said in the that. Levels, because I, I gotta ask yeah, yeah. this part because I've been I've had this wonder thought in my head too. 
<laughs> so every level, like the, every world, so it's like like one one two one three one. Da, da. Every yeah. one of the worlds has two themes associated with it. Mm-hmm. But I noticed on almost all of them, there's a distinct medley that's kind of underlying on all of them. <laughs> like, yep, uh, yep. and I because at first I was listening to like the factory floor theme, like ad nauseum. And then I ended up really falling in love with the lift <laughs> theme, which is like the first track for the fitness center, which I found funny that you work at a factory full of robots. It's like, we got this fitness right. center, pump these robots up. <laughs> um, but I was like, wait That's a minute, so I hear the sound in this too. So is that true though? There's that, there's that like, do, 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 like that, that melody. <laughs> That's a, a yeah. recurring melody. That's a light, you know, that, light, that, light motif. I guess this might not uh, okay. might not oh, yeah, have as much weight with you guys, but it, it definitely is uh, another one of the through lines from Undertale. Undertale had a, a very common motif through through almost all of its tracks that I, I felt like really helped to reinforce almost an emotional feeling throughout the adventure, where you you kind of have that uh, that almost a sense of comfort in in returning to that that little melody that you can start to associate with that experience, and and I felt like that was important for Carl too that. Uh, there is a title theme for Carl, which actually does not use that motif. <laughs> but I feel like that it, it, in my heart, that that little melody, that little bit is is definitely Carl's theme. So. Yes. Well, we have a little bit of time before we get into our bonus round. Do you think we could play some of the music from Carl now? Some of the music that you brought. Oh with yeah, you? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So here we are. This is uh, we're going to listen to Herman's theme from C A R L, which spells Carl. <laughs> <laughs> theme from the game carl yeah this one's this one's drew's drew this is this is fun <laughs> i'm really enjoying <laughs> Thank you. that Thank yeah you. oh man so so it's definitely it's it's on the fake bit side so you're, you're using some of yeah. the, those chippy sounds but along with some other instrumentation i feel like you got like that 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 um it's some kind of like chord or something in the background with that bass line it's kind of it's kind of zipping around with this track it's a lot of fun I feel like <laughs> it really pull, pulls it along really having fun with this one Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I've, I've honestly, this is the song that I, I told you earlier that I've, I've been looking forward to being able to talk about the music of this game, and this is like one that has really stuck out to me, just because I feel like it's important to me to, uh, to really build that connection between an experience and the soundtrack. I feel like you have to have some sort of methodology as far as like matching the experience to what you're hearing and with that song especially like there's an early um synth that pops in i I sort of tweaked in a way that i felt sound sounded at least somewhat adjacent to like a car horn and if you if you've played the game oh is it it this is it this sermon in a van yes so if you if you hear in the background the like (laughs) <laughs> oh oh okay See, that was what I, I was imagining as like a, a car horn oh so. i thought that was like a synth chord like in the background like like a, yeah. like a chord that was being played that's like a horn oh, that's cool I feel, it really pulls it along I, I like it i also had to learn the name of that uh that like ridged wooden instrument a guiro oh <laughs> i had to learn in order to oh or I, yeah like, I, I don't know if i'm pronouncing that right or not but i like i used one in you know music class in elementary school i think yeah but i i, I had to research to find the name of that because I knew I wanted to have that kind of like that quirky feel where it's like rank, rank, no, you know, the, like just kind of <laughs> the um that Paper Mario track had a, had a lot of interesting like yeah. percussion in it too. You know? Exactly. And, and the only one I can yeah. remember was Vibra Slap, probably because I played one in like middle school at some point. <laughs> and they're like, nice. guess what this is? I'm like, oh my god, it's that sound from Bugs Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> the bloop the blurp. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, it's just real like uh, maybe briefly here. Like, tell us a little bit about your experience, like um, with this music. I, have you had experience with music prior to this, or is this something that you oh, sort of man. just kind of played around with? Every time? <laughs> music has always been an interest of mine for sure. I, I uh, 
as, as early as like age two or three, I would start kind of picking out songs on, on the keyboard or piano <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if one was available. Mm -hmm. And my parents saw that and like, you know, immediately they were like, oh, we gotta, we gotta encourage this. So <laughs> I ended up, I, I took almost a decade of piano lessons growing up as a kid. And oh, that wow. was most of where I learned my, my basic kind of music theory. Uh, and then as a, you know, um, as a student and then onward in, into adulthood, I, I kind of dabbled around with just, you know, um, uh, just some, some basic compositions in FL Studio and, and playing around with what, uh, what the, the sort of sounds that I enjoyed. So I, I've always, uh, a through line in almost all my work is I've been obsessed with Daft Punk my entire life. <laughs> so I, I feel like that's been the longest musical obsession of mine that uh, just kind of, I, I've always loved the repetitive driving electronic tracks which is appropriate enough for video game music i feel like that's right. <laughs> that's yeah. a, a majority of of, of of video game soundtracks um tend to to fall into that category i'd say and it's a good I, love I, to have yeah yeah i i love the pure sort of just i, I don't I, I, there's something about just a, a really like a pure sin a, a pure synth with a, a uh, you know a, a catchy melody just it sticks in your head you know yeah and, and uh, i love that stuff i feel like they definitely took house and that french house sound and, and distilled it into like this oh this, yeah like this 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 super drug that you can't get enough of <laughs> and um and yeah and, and i'm so I'm, I'm happy it took off because it made it made that style of music much more popular around yeah, the world yeah so we got much more of it um, but yeah, no, I totally agree. It's, it's, do you think some of the drums in this track are kind of Daft Punky inspired? As I hear that. Kind oh, of... I'm sure. Just by nature of just being on the baseline of my neuronal <laughs> backdrop, you know. <laughs> like I gotta say, I'm listening to it. I'm going around the world, oh, around the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, can I can I ask for a quick indulgence? Could I have you all play? A quick bit of the lo-fi version of this thing because that I, I feel like this is oh yeah this is appropriate yeah. for this podcast just because that version I, I I made a separate version of this theme for specifically when Herman calls you when you're not in his mobile surveillance unit oh like when and he calls you say hey come turn in this golden shit yeah yeah I, I made a version that sort of sounded like I was imagining almost like a Game Boy camera type uh, track or something <laughs> like that where where he's he's calling you remotely so it's a little bit more you know authentic or, or crushed you can imagine but i think that the lo-fi version of this theme is my favorite song that i, I ended up putting together for the soundtrack so i feel like that might be uh, yeah let's do it all right <laughs> let's give it a listen pound like functionality <laughs> <laughs> well if you come on up to the truck i can try to help install it Herman, if out. we do a, a if we I do a this. repackage with with voice acting, we'll have to have you come on. Oh, oh man, you get, <laughs> Pernell, Pernell's voice is is wasted on my show. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> you, yeah, it's it's so distinct. Um, I'm loving this. This is great. It's uh, I love that you have these two different styles of it. It's, it's not even. Yeah, it's, 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 not it's just, actually a, yeah. like a it's a slightly faster BPM as well. Yeah, and I've actually I I just I, I felt like. I don't know if you do. You guys write music? Have you all like dabbled in, in composition? Oh, that's all Rob. Yeah, I certainly have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, do you ever have a moment where you're you're working on some new track, and at some point you've got the kind of like the shell of your 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 composition together, but the melody, I I, I almost it it feels like sometimes when I'm when I'm working, it, uh, there's like a there's a moment where you can almost imagine like. I can imagine where the rest of this this melody is gonna go, and there's only one way it could be. <laughs> you know, like there's. I feel like that, at least I don't know if that's something that can be relatable, but no, I, feel like I, there are I, some I think tracks about where, that. Yeah, like if you've got the chord progression down, and you're trying to figure out what the what the lead is gonna sound like. I feel like sometimes you'll just you'll find yourself in a position where you know what's gonna f be the most catchy. Yeah. Your worm that you can, you I, can put together. I feel like a lot of people write in different ways. A lot of like, like I love to start with chords and rhythm. Yeah. I mean, I mean mainly rhythm because I do a lot of like hip hop and drum and bass. And, okay, and, cool. Uh, but that's like my thing. Actually, but the um, a lot of people will start with chords first, and then like that kind of informs them of like where their melody is going to be. But I know a lot of other artists they'll start with just the straight melody, and mm -hmm. then sort of like figure out what they want with that, and then they'll build up around that. But the way you said, like, you get stuck 
thinking like not stuff, but you, you were thinking like there's only one way this melody can go, right? Like you yeah. hear it and it's perfect. But it, it's it's so interesting to me when I hear other songs. Like, yeah, I wish I could think of a good example where, you, especially with lyrics, you feel like there's only one way this is supposed to sound, but like it goes in a different direction. Like, um, oh, I wasn't expecting yeah. that progression. I wasn't expecting that note it's to be like there. A, it's almost like a slight deja vu in a sense because yeah. music, even though music is created and there's infinite amounts of music available, it still feels like music builds on top of other music. So you can kind oh, of yeah. get a yeah. feeling for where it's supposed to go. Like, yeah, a lot of pop, I feel like a lot of pop music and like, or and that's even shoegaze I listen to does it. Like, you hear like a just weird reverb on a guitar. You're like, okay. It's going to do this for like another six measures. This is going to go like, like, that's what it's supposed to do. That's what my head's telling me is going to do. But yeah. the composer's like, screw you, but I'm going to go wow instead. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that, that's why like every everything is different. Every song is going to be different because yeah. everyone has their own voice. You know, Everyone's hearing their own voice in their yeah. head doing something completely different. Um, well, I think there's definitely exciting. something to be said for like both of those kind of ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like you can have a song that really subverts your expectations and goes in a different direction than you're expecting. But I, I also feel like if you have something that's unique but predictable, it ends up being something that you can almost hum along with yeah. without having heard even once. <laughs> you know, and I, I love that kind of that, yeah. that feeling when you. You get into a track and it's just like I know what this is. Like I feel, uh, this is, yeah. I got I'm one. <laughs> I got one example that it comes to mind for me a lot in life too. Like, as you not a lot, but it's happened before. Like, have you ever gone to say uh, karaoke with friends or something? Right? <laughs> oh god! And like someone picked a song, and yeah. it was like, yeah, we're going to do this sing along together. And you're just like, yeah, that's all sing along. <laughs> you never sung this dang song in your life, or you might know one line out of twenty. So sure, you're kind of going along with it, but then. You don't actually know the words that are coming up, but there's something about being in the room, listening to everyone sing together, and you singing too. You start to hit this weird point where in your head, you can kind of preempt the lyrics before yeah, knowing what they yeah. are. And I've done that on an odd number of cases. It's, subconsciously, it's there. And so when you start to like kind of flex that part of your brain of like, okay, <laughs> I, I'm just going to creatively come up with these lyrics. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll flow through that conduit mm -hmm. and out your mouth. <laughs> I, we were yeah. at, um, we were at that, we were at that retro game convention, uh, retro world in Connecticut. And I was playing rock band. I wasn't sure if it, if you were, it was me and Cameron and I was playing the guitar part and no one wanted to sing. So I was doing the guitar and the singing at the same time. And I was, I was playing, uh, I run, Okay. I forget who sings that song. And um and I couldn't remember half the lyrics. I couldn't focus on the lyrics and the guitar notes at the same time of the game. And so I was like, okay, I know I know most of this. I got the I melody. Know most of this song. But it was definitely flying through through my my, my head there. Um, but I was thinking of one artist that definitely subverts like melodies and chords where you don't think they'll ever go, and that's David Bowie. And like his whole oh, yeah, his yeah. whole career, I feel, but it was like um, I think of the song "Ashes to Ashes." Like a lot of his stuff, like in the mid to late '80s, is just like, like how like it's so different from everything else. Like of like of course that's going to take off, you know. Like he's he was he was a genius, like an absolute like alien. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, if it's all right with you, we're going to get into the final part of our show. We call yeah, the, let's do it. The bonus round. <laughs> <laughs> and the bonus round is where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. Um, and so, um, uh, Drew, what do you have for us for your remix? I, I think you sent me yeah, a couple. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I've, I've landed on uh, a game that is very near and dear to my heart because it was the first game that I ever played, which was uh, Jazz Jackrabbit uh, on PC. That was a kind of Epic Games' first debut title before the the runaway success of Fork Knife. We had Jazz Jackrabbit, <laughs> and uh, this was their kind of attempt at making a PC conversion of Sonic and Mega Man sort of mashed up together. And uh, as a kid in the 90s that did not have any gaming consoles, this was my my introduction into the gaming sphere. And uh, I found a, a remix here by Signify that I think is really just kind of banging. So, yeah. <laughs> right, let's get to it. This is from Jazz Jackrabbit, the uh, Tube Electric remix. <laughs>
back. That was the Two Bletric remix from Jazz Jackrabbit. That was uh, arranged and um, performed by Sig- uh, Sidnify, S I D N I F Y, a Hungarian duo. And wow, they they've got they don't have a whole lot on the internet, but like based off of this, holy crap! Doesn't it make you hungry <laughs> for more? Oh God, I'll see myself. Yeah, out. you're out. Ah! You're out. <laughs> I'll see myself out. Please. <laughs> Um, wow. So yeah, uh, yeah. This it, sometimes it's like um, when we're looking for like we have a specific like game or song in mind, and we hope that someone else did a cover of it, mm-hmm. and we're like, oh my gosh, like someone did like a heavy metal version, or someone did like a like a, a light piano version of the song. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's always nice to run into that stuff. It's yeah. like it's all it's that was a, good. And it's also nice when you come across like sometimes you'll like looking for a game that you specifically you're adamant about finding and it's like one person on the internet <laughs> t- took the time to work with it's like wow uh-huh. you're like my kinship we're kins <laughs> well, well the track that i found here this is this one i came across this one in a weird roundabout way there's a game that is still in development or maybe it's about to be released called lords of exile it's uh it's a game that is really 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 inspired by the original castlevania series on the nes um, and it looks awesome. And the soundtrack that you can hear through their little trailer is really, really cool. And it was It's so cool that an uh, uh, artist by the name of Castle Master did a heavy metal remix of it, um, of the track. He's, it's called Dark Waters, I'm assuming. Um, it's hit its Kickstarter goal where it's going to have Dominic Ninmark and, oh, well, I'm already goodness. sold. I forget the other artist's name, but they're not only going to be contributing tracks, but they're also going to be like lead producers of the audio producers Ooh. of the game now. Ooh. So it, it's going to be pretty dope. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use that word again. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally hip. No, I'm gonna, down with the kids. It's going to be popping. <laughs> um, Christ. Yeah, this is a Dark Waters from Lords of Exile. This one is arranged and performed by Castle Master.
That was a Castle Master with a whammy bar on Dark Waters from the game Lords of Exile, which is I think still in Kickstarter. Um, but you have heard of this one? Yeah. So yeah. I it was one of those things where I I'm not sure if someone had posted it in a form I was in or if it was on Kotaku or what, but I did stumble across the Kickstarter. I have a bad habit when it comes to Kickstarters, even for a game I want. I find myself thinking. I don't have the money to be investing in like 20 things that will come out in the year 2026. <laughs> um, so instead, I try to look and go, what are the odds that this is going to get funded without any input from me? And chances <laughs> are, it will. So if I'm like, they're like, well, they're not giving out anything that I absolutely need to get by being a part of the thing. So I just want the game. Like what was like the Euden Chronicles game? Can't, I guess an example of that where I was like, it's a sweet, it's a sweet code and spiritual successor. There's no way in hell this won't get funded. I don't need to put money into this. I'll just wait for it to come out. And sure enough, when it comes out in the future, they didn't add anything new that only Kickstarter people got. So I'm like, thanks, guys. I they probably would got like early, early access. I don't need that. I'm I'm inundated in games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just true. want the game when it's done. <laughs> Set me oh, up. Oh, you got a backlog? <laughs> oh, oh, what are those? Backlog? Yeah. <laughs> I live a backlog right now. All right. So, Pranel, what's your, um, your track? Pull it out of the backlog for us, please. All right. So... <laughs> As we already know, I've mentioned it multiple times in the episode, so it kind of goes without saying that to me, one of the most important aspects to making a video game great is heart. What makes the heart, well, what makes the game feel like it resonates with you? Makes you feel like you come away from it smiling a grin that you don't understand why you're grinning with it. Uh, and of course, we talked about cave stories being one of the epitomes of that vibe. So I went looking for a cover of the Running Hell theme from that game because it is probably my second favorite track Ooh. in the game behind on to grass town so this actually i originally had one i found by god metal which is superb by the way mm. but then i came across another track that just sounded so much nicer for the context i'm going with here so this is a piano cover of the running hell theme from cave story oh, composed yeah. by sebastian <laughs> wolf it's good let's do it
You're listening to the Running Hell piano cover from the game Cave Story, covered and actually arranged by Sebastian Wolf. This, oh God, this track is just superb. The way he did this, I wouldn't have thought you could get that, that, this, that track to sound as good as it does and with the same driving force as it does on a piano. But yeah. he pulled it off in such a way that, yeah, I could listen to this loop for a while. And to be frank, if it were to have, there was to be some sort of patch down the line where this was dropped in that level instead of the original track, I'd be all right with that. <laughs> it would do this. It would still serve the job. It would do the purpose. Yeah. So my first thought is, where is the sheet music? I want. I want to challenge myself. I want to learn this. <laughs> he it's did. A, he did make it available. It's it, out there. Yeah, it's available. Yeah. On, on, yeah. on his YouTube. Um, I think. I think all of his compositions have it. But this. This one sounds complicated to play. Yeah. There's a lot of. There's a lot of parts. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of moving parts here with the with the rhythm and the melody at the same time. Yeah, but like I've wow. said like in the past, like I guess I mentioned the idea of heart and all that, but the whole idea of this part of the game and this track playing, first of all, you have to do very specific things to even end up at this point in the game. But it's 100% worth it. Like I can't even see myself playing through this game any other way anymore. It has to end with this, where Quote and Curly are working together to go to the bowels of the planet to defeat the demon crown holder in a way that is just outright it's a bonkers final battle, in my opinion. And uh, <laughs> then that makes it especially fun and makes me happy about this whole part of the game is that you're jumping down to the hole and you have this special jet pet that gets like a certain number of charges out of it. And Pixel designed the cord, the first corridor in a way where you have to know the exact way to time the push up, the brush off of the jet pack because he gives you just enough room to use the exact amount of boosts to get where you need to go. Yeah, that's, and then good, that's a, good design. It's great design. Yeah. At the very bottom is your partner unconscious on the ground. So you have an item that you picked up earlier in the game, like a towing cable, and you wrap it around you, and you carry her on your back. Mm. So for the first part, the second part of this area, you're like running through a collapsing cave with like these angel demons flying after you, shooting at you, and you're carrying her on your back. But then she wakes up, and then she's firing her gun from the back, and you're firing your gun yeah. from the front, <laughs> and you're like, you're like dual backing the whole battle, and it's freaking amazing. It's just, it's a sort of game, again, like, I've been playing games for years. I have never had a game where I was in a sequence where I was like, yeah, they got my back, and I got their back. We're going to take them out. <laughs> We're going to do it. Uh, the ending of Shovel Knight. That did it for me. Oh, see, now i got to beat Shovel Knight. Oh. I never got past the Enchantress's <laughs> Castle. I just keep it's going back so to the Plague Knight level. Uh, Shovel Knight and Shield Knight working together is like one of the best feelings ever. It's so good. It's so awesome. So I need that. Yeah. Well, for more information on the bonus round, you can go to rhythmandpixels.com, where we'll have links to the artist's band camps and sound clouds and everywhere you can – uh, stream the music, buy the music, and support these incredible artists. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for joining us on episode 34-6 of Rhythm and Pixels. This is our, our episode on inspirations... And influences with our special guest, uh, Nintendo Drew, uh, producer, I'm sorry, developer, uh, and composer, composer for the new game, Carl. So thanks yeah. for, thanks for coming on. Talk, talk, thanks for telling us about this game and, and sharing your kind of your musical culture with us. Thank you for giving yeah, me absolutely. a chance to review it so I could discover it and then be like so obsessed with it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. gotta get him on the show. Cause oh man. You know, you have no idea how good that feels. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> One last thing to make you feel good, then. Just know this and another <laughs> game called Europa are pretty much the reasons why my reviews are going to be behind for the rest of the month. Because you're so, <laughs> you're so more more interested in playing these. Yes, yeah, I yeah. want to play these. I want to play the newer games. I want to play these games. <laughs> Very specific games. Well, before we head out of here, before we uh, before we close the light, turn the lights out for the, for the night, um, Drew, why don't you uh, tell our listeners where they can find more about you and where they can find more about your game carl absolutely yeah so uh, my main platform is youtube uh youtube.com slash nintendry that's where i cover all my my passion for retro gaming uh and i i recently breached back into the the field of game development with carl so if you look up carlgame.com that's our landing page we are on steam on uh ps4 ps5 xbox and nintendo switch so pick your poison you know yeah <laughs> uh, if you like if you like classic PC and Nintendo games especially, and, and just, uh, I, if you're like me and have a real nostalgia for the, the classic platformers, and, and want a little bit, a little bit extra, a little bit of that, that special sauce, that oomph that makes it just stick in your mind a little longer, I, ho I hope that we've 
been able to encapsulate that with Carl. I think so. Yeah, it sounds I'm... like it's been pretty <laughs> pretty successful on the side of the, uh, oh, yeah. the side of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. We're gonna have links to all that stuff on our website. But um, if our listeners, uh, if you want to get in contact with us, if you have a track suggestion, a topic suggestion, or even a, a, a guest suggestion, please send us an email. Rhythm and pixels at hotmail.com. That's right. It's hotmail. I'm not, Real. Get, I'm not getting rid of it. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> um, if you wanted to get a track listing from this episode um, and a track listing and, and access to all of our episodes, all of our past episodes, the best way to find all of that is at our website. Rhythmandpixels.com. Check us out on Discord. We have a Discord server for the show. It's uh, The link is at the top of the webpage. Um, it just says, you know, Discord. It's, a, it's an invite that goes right into it. You can talk to other people who are interested in games, music, and other podcasters as well. If you're, um, if you're Shocktober. Looking for more. And it's now a Shocktober fest in which we all drink um, beers and play scary games. Is that right? Or in the case of some folks who are really cool, like games that will that have a scary-ishness. S- spooky. Spooky, spooky, but not not scary. Spooky, but getting spooky. Me, uh, I want to, I want to <laughs> piss my knickers. So I'm good. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, that, that's going on a t-shirt. <laughs> Speaking of which, if you want to find our merchandise now, um, so um, yeah, uh, our YouTube radio station is offline uh, from now until about December until SquareSoft gives us the thumbs up to start using. Um, none of their music ever again. Check us out on <laughs> twitch.tv slash Rhythm and Pixels for an 8-bit and 16-bit uh, 24-7 radio station playing nothing but classics and deep cuts. Um, so check us out there. If you want to support the show, the best thing you can do is just tell people about it. You know, tell your friends, tell your family, hit the subscribe button. Tell your family, hit the subscribe button. You know, tell your dog, put a sign on your dog and walk your dog so everyone sees the dog. Build a says, really awesome robot and send him on an espionage mission into the underground depths <laughs> of the legendary. <laughs> while he's there, he's going to leave calling cards for Rhythm and Pixels so That's people right. will know they've been there. Yeah, they it's sound awesome. Not a dying medium. We're here. <laughs> We're here keeping, keeping radio alive. Um, so yeah, you can also go to Patreon, patreon.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. As a member there, you get access to uh, monthly live streams of the show where we record the show um, for you as, as the audience. You get also some cool stuff. There's other stickers, there's mugs, there's exclusive t-shirts, um, and there's even some cool things you can do with our radio station. You can record your own commercials, you know, however you want to do it on the radio station. It gets put in rotation. And we also like to thank all of our uh, Patreon members who are at the highest levels uh, at the end of every episode. So we would first want to thank uh, Brooke, and who's in there twice now. Thank you very much, Brooke. <laughs> uh, frankly, Zappa and Khalid, all three of you, thank you so, so much. I finally got around to writing back Khalid. I didn't realize he left the message, and Aww. I felt really bad about it. So Khalid, thank you so much for the kind words. We also want to thank uh, the number one, killing it with the uh, hacking uh, alphabetical situation here. Uh, Kristen, GameFan44. Martyrus, host of the ReVGM podcast. Mike Myers, Alf Person. Alex Messenger, host of AVGM Journey, which I think he's going to be on coming on. He's coming on. Uh, Andreas Milberg, Brian Pitt, Cameron Worma, Carlos, Kung Fu Carlito, host of the Heroes 3 podcast, podcast about uh, 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 Asian cinema and Kung Fu movies. I uh, want to thank Chris Wisner, a.k.a. Musashi219. The wise guy. And Christopher Senstrom, Chuck Kowalski, Davey Cakes, David Taylor, and Chalada Bregol, Harold Howard, Triple Jeff, Justin Schneider, host of XVGM Radio, Keith Shusterman, Dr. Michael Bridgewater, who, um, uh, thank you so much for the email. I, I finally also got right. Got He's right. also coming on at some point soon. Oh, yeah. We, I, we got we to gotta, we gotta bring his lovely old butt back on the show. I want to thank uh, Rage Cage, host of the VG Emporium, Reinhardt Selkova, Sleepy S'more, Steve Miller, Taco, Ed Wilson, host of the VG Embassy, and Zach Thornbach. I want to thank all of you and, and so much, so many more um, for, for helping support our little show. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. Believe you me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so we're recording a little bit early. I'm going to be out of town for a little while, but we'll be back in the saddle talking about our summer games. Oh, no, no, no. Not, you know, I think actually next week we have the movie. I, I'll, have to, I'll have to double check. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I would love to do that. <laughs> I, I, Rather than Pixels, the movie. So I have more time to finish my games. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks everyone for, for listening to our show. Thank you very much, Drew, for coming on and spending uh, spending your evening with us. It was a lot of, of fun course. having you on, yeah. man. Thank you for having me. Um, all right, and uh, without... Uh, I got nothing more to say. Have a great week. So <laughs> I, that's all I got to say. He's like, I'm Rob Why? Nichols. You do the thing. <laughs> oh, I got to think. Thanks for listening to the show. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. Have a great week. And remember... 
Well, you heard what Drew said throughout the episode. He had this idea. It was sitting in his back pocket. Then it went to the dungeon. Then it came out of the dungeon, back to his back <laughs> pocket. And then eventually, yep. through thick or thin, it became uh, it became a thing. He produced it. It sounds and plays wonderfully. What does that mean for you? Well, don't give up on your pet projects and dreams and thoughts. Tuck those bad boys away because you never know when the stars will line up in such a way that that fiction can become reality. Um... Never let it ride out. Let it let, always hang on to your dreams and let them play out later as they can, as best they can. And that's me being done. Now we're done. <laughs> yeah, follow your dreams. Try your best. Eat your vegetables. That's right, and you'll be fine. Including the Brussels sprouts. Those strings are delicious. <laughs> <laughs>